In the words of the legendary chef and my personal hero, Anthony Bourdain, food is everything we are. It's an extension of a nationalist feeling, ethnic feeling, your personal history, your province, your region, your tribe, your grandma. It's inseparable from those from the get-go. Welcome to Every Dish, A Story, a podcast about a place of food in our lives and what it meant to our ancestors. I'm your host, Kat, and I'm going to take you to a new location every two weeks to connect to who we are. The perfect borscht is what life should be like, which, alas, it never is. Welcome to season two of the podcast, Every Dish, A Story. This is episode 13. I'm your host, Kat. And today, I want to express my utmost support, admiration, and respect for Ukrainian people. So I invite you to explore a history of a dish that is usually mistaken for a Russian dish, but it's not. It is Ukrainian. I am, of course, talking about borscht. Borscht is a traditional East Slavic dish, which has a rich color due to the use of beets. Unlike other broth soups, it has a thick consistency. Borscht is considered the national dish of Ukraine, although it's a culinary treasure of Russia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and Moldova. Jews also have their own recipes for borscht. Bulgakov, Mayakovsky mentioned the rich flavor and color of borscht in their literary works. The first mention of this dish dates back to the 16th century. In the journals of Alexander II and Catherine the Great, borscht is discovered as a favorite dish of the nobility and royal family. Ukrainians, Russians, Poles, Romanians, and Lithuanians cook red borscht in different ways, so there's no specific standard recipe. In each country, the cuisine is supplemented by folk techniques. Some boil salt and stew the beets, some add potatoes to the soup, others boil the beets for 30-40 minutes before adding the potatoes. This dish can be adapted for any country, as something new can be added to the soup. Borscht is a soup with lots of ingredients and rich flavor, because traditionally it is cooked with meat broth. There are as many borscht recipes as there are countries. The cooking method can vary depending on the choice of meat, vegetables, spices, herbs and seasonings. Beets, tomatoes, potatoes, onions and carrots are necessarily for the recipe. But beans, peppers, zucchini and mushrooms are additional ingredients. Borscht differs from regular hard soups in that it is a complicated recipe with lots of ingredients and a long cooking time. Each vegetable in borscht is prepared separately, and it takes up to five hours to cook. So who invented borscht? Well, there is no definitive answer to this question, and the debate continues to this day. Among the many versions, guesses and assumptions, the most popular is the idea that borscht was invented by, guess who? Yes, the ancient Romans. The idea is certainly incredible, but confirmed by the data of the archaeological excavations. It turns out that in ancient Rome there were plantations for growing beets and cabbage. Different versions of borscht were cooked with meat as well as all kinds of different river and sea fish from various seafood and also lean borscht or vegetarian borscht with addition of olive oil and various local spices and herbs. So how did the ancient Roman borscht get to Ukraine? Well. From the second half of the 1st century BC to the middle of the 3rd century AD, garrisons of the Roman soldiers were in the territory, which is now Crimea. The Romans brought with them their own varieties of cabbage and beet and many other vegetables, which were more tasty and easier to grow than the previously grown ancient Greek ones. To be historically accurate, the recipe for the modern classic Ukrainian borscht repeats the recipe of the popular ancient Thracian cabbage and beetroot chowder, which included onions, meat, and lard. However, Ukrainians do not want to share the palm with ancient Romans and insist that the classic borscht as we know today was first cooked about 365 years ago during the siege of Azov. According to one version, borscht was first cooked in the territory of Kiev and Rus in the 14th century, and the name of the soup was formed by the root borscht and the ancient sh, the first meaning red, which reflects the color of the dish, and the second, the presence of, in the recipe of cabbage, which is traditionally used in a soup. There are other nations who like to claim the origin of borscht to themselves, the Poles, Romanians, Moldovans, and the Lithuanians. According to extant information, the first borscht was cooked on beet kvas, which is a fermented drink, and the cooks diluted it with water and brought it to the boil. 
After cooking it in the oven, the dish was seasoned with salt and herbs. To this day, such traditions only survive in Polish cuisine. According to another opinion, the word borscht came from the borscht plant, which was present in the original peasant version of the soup. Over time, borscht became very popular. It was loved not only by the commoners, but also by the royalty. For example, Catherine II called borscht her favorite dish and kept a separate cook for its preparation at the court. As I mentioned earlier, there are many varieties of borscht. First, it differs in the way it's cooked. Some people think that borscht should be cooked with lard and meat, and some think that with mushrooms, fish, chicken or other poultry. Also, borscht can be served in different ways, either hot or cold. The cold version is often prepared in warm seasons. It is based on kefir and pickled beets. In this type of soup, uh, sour cream is added, along with greens and boiled eggs, and served for lunch in the heat as a kind of a beet cold soup. It is worth noting that borscht is quite a time-consuming dish to prepare. The classic recipe consists of several stages, and it takes from 3 to 5 hours to prepare the whole soup. This is due for the special treatment of vegetables that are required. For example, beets are stewed or boiled separately, and a special frying mix is made from onions and carrots. Borscht is mentioned in many works by Russian writers and poets. It was served to heroes by Mikhail Bulgakov, Vladimir Mayakovsky, and many, many others. At the Euro 2012, which was held in Ukraine, guests of the fan zone were taught the art of preparing borscht by specially hired chefs. Several years ago, the war over soup took over on social media, when the official Twitter account of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs tweeted, a timeless classic, hashtag borscht, is one of the most famous and beloved dishes in Russia and the symbol of traditional cuisine. Now, to the average Twitter user, the Russians' message about borscht may seem obvious and harmless, but to Ukrainians who consider borscht the national dish, the Russian tweet is wartime propaganda, especially given the current occupation of Crimea and the territorial conflict in eastern Ukraine that has been raging since 1214, and now, of course, the um, quote-unquote special operation from Russia. Even then... Ukrainian Twitter sphere reacted with anger, leaving comments like, as if stealing Crimea wasn't enough, you had to go and steal borscht from Ukraine as well. You see, to many, Russia's claim to such a quintessentially Ukrainian dish embodies a much broader trend of Russia's historical oppression of the Ukrainian language, politics, and above all, independence. Borscht definitely comes from Ukraine said Ole Salu, a New York chef and head consultant at Veselka, an iconic Ukrainian eatery in New York's East Village, who prides herself on her Ukrainian origin. I say it's Ukrainian not just from a nationalist standpoint, but because the soup comes from Ukraine, and these ingredients were found in the country's archaeological records in the distant past. So what about the millions of ethnic Russians who believe and insist that their favorite red soup is actually Russian? Yes, Russian people claim it's their food, Lou says, but it's a food that they got as a result of occupation. According to Alessia, borscht did not simply seep into the collective consciousness of Russian cuisine, but rather entered the Soviet mainstream during the Stalin era as a result of the Kremlin's deliberate efforts. In an attempt to collectivize the largest country on earth, Stalin instructed the People's Commissioner of Food, Anastas Mikoyan, to create a Soviet national cuisine that would meet the needs of more than a hundred different nationalities living in the USSR. So, official study of cultural melting pots and mass-produced food led Mikoyan to the United States, where he fell in love with hamburgers, hot dogs, and ice cream. Upon his return, Mikoyan launched factory production of ice cream throughout the Soviet Union and popularized effective kitchen dishes such as katlety, which are minced meat patties, in everyday cooking. In 1939, he published the propaganda-enhanced book of tasty and healthy food, a standardized cookbook often given to newlyweds in the Soviet Union by the Communist Party, a book that is actually still in print today. You see, Mikoyan needed to create a mass cultural identity for these Soviet dishes. It's fascinating to read what he chose from each place, whether Ukraine or Georgia, while remaining quite vague. So you see, this cookbook made all of these dishes part of the Soviet culture, and thus Russian since Russia was the most important culture of the USSR. 
So what exactly does this Soviet cuisine bible say about borscht? Chapter 6, named soups, begins with cabbage-based shi soups, listing six different recipes, followed by borscht, then summer borscht, which is made with zucchini, celery, and beet greens, and finally the differentiated Ukrainian borscht. According to Mikoyan's recipe, standard borscht contains meat, beets, cabbage, root vegetables, onions, tomato paste, vinegar, and sugar, while Ukrainian borscht contains meat, cabbage, potatoes, beets, tomato paste, carrots, parsnips, onions, bacon fat, oil, vinegar, and garlic, and garnished with sour cream and chopped parsley. The Ukrainian recipe, which is a separate iteration of the standardized version, is by far the best known today. While borscht may be considered the quintessential Russian cuisine in the wider world, very few non-Russians are familiar with a much less appealing Russian version, which is called shi. Shi is basic cabbage soup, essentially borscht without the beets and the meat. The similar yet different culture and geography make unraveling Russian and Ukrainian history almost an impossible task. Pro-Russian ideologies are using the region's complex past to promote a rewritten history that draws a straight line from the current Russian regime back to the original Slavic civilization. The problem also lies in the fact that the center of ancient Russia was Kiev, now the capital of Ukraine. Over the past millennium, Ukraine's largest city has been repeatedly invaded, occupied, and has violently revolted, often against the bastion of Russian influence in Ukrainian politics. So rebranding Ukraine's national dish as Russian is even more ironic and very offensive in the light of the Kolodomor, the man-made Stalinist famine of 1932 and 1933, when violent collectivization, aggressive grain purchases, and confiscation of food supplies led to the starvation of millions of Ukrainians. The exact number of deaths and whether the famine should be considered genocide remains a contentious issue and is still debated and often denied by the Russians today. The battle over borscht and its origin and meaning continues on the internet in a way of definition of the soup. Ukrainian Wikipedia lists borscht as quote unquote found in Ukrainian, Belarusian, Polish, Lithuanian, Iranian and Jewish national cuisines, but does not mention Russians. Meanwhile, the Russian language Wikipedia says that borscht is a type of soup that is cooked with beets, which give it uh, its characteristic red color. It is a traditional dish of the Eastern Slavs, a common first course in Ukrainian cuisine. Obviously, the non-Slavic world perceives borscht as a Russian dish, while the Poles know it only as their favorite Polish borscht. This is also problematic because at least half of Ukraine has been occupied by Poland for several centuries. Meanwhile, the common English spelling of borscht with a T at the end comes from a Yiddish transliteration, since it was mostly Jewish refugees fleeing Eastern Europe who brought the soup to the West. Food travels with people, you see, so borscht is now popular all over the world. Borscht is everywhere now, says Dima Marcinuk, chef of the restaurant Veselka. Maybe 5% of Russians say it's their dish, but the other 95 know that borscht is actually Ukrainian. For Martinuk, it's not uh, nationalism that is more important, but the taste of the soup, because he makes and serves hundreds of liters of borscht every week. He employs his grandmother's classic recipe, which starts with pork broth cooked from rib bones. Then you have to use the sweet cabbage. Then it is important that the other ingredients are cooked separately, in a separate pan. They need to be fried, onions, carrots, and chopped beets. Then. Add sunflower oil, butter, spices, tomato paste. And be sure to add something acidic, like white vinegar or lemon juice. That will help maintain the rich red color. He also has a very untraditional advice uh, about cooking borscht in a pizza oven. The open flame works wonders with the cooking and it turns out very tasty, apparently. Variety is the real beauty of borscht. And there are countless varieties of this soup even just throughout Ukraine with or without meat, beans or certain spices. There are as many versions of borscht as there are Eastern European grandmothers. People have an emotional attachment to the soup and everyone has a different idea of what it is and what it should be. Everyone is right about borscht. But Ukrainians are very independent and of course protect not only their land, but also their food. Because food is part of culture and identity. Food can be shared and it can bring people together.
On this note, I'd like to finish our little trip into the history of Ukrainian borscht. And I invite you to try and cook this magnificent soup yourselves. So head on over to my YouTube channel, Chatter Cats, and check out the new video recipe. In these very scary times, please continue to stay human, not to spread aggression or hate. And don't forget that coronavirus has not left the earth. So continue to comply with uh, government restrictions. Continue to eat well, love cats, and recycle your garbage when you can. Bye-bye for now. Now we're back on March 24th with a new journey.